Hello and welcome back to the shop and today's video will be about adjusting the gibs and the backlash on the mill. Now I did film part of this when I was putting it together but the footage came out kind of crappy so I'm redoing it. So um, I may end up adding some of that footage in with this so if you see a different, a different screwdriver being used or a different shirt being worn, that's why. Um, I do have a couple of view appreciation gifts I want to show and uh, just one other quick thing. His last video got called on pushing on the center of the bearing. Yeah, I did it. Um, <laughs> I didn't have anything that fit the outer race. Um, I didn't have a socket that was uh, small enough to fit through the bore, but big enough to hit the whole outside of the bearing. So I just shoved them in there and pushed them in there to get it done. And you guys called me on it, which is perfectly fair game. Um, it's not anything that spins really fast. It's just the, the, the hand crank, so it's not that huge of a, huge of a thing. Could I have damaged bearings? Yeah. Did I? Probably not. There's not really a huge press fit on that, but like I said, you guys called me on it, which is perfectly fine. I put these videos out there and um, for everybody to see, and all my mistakes are out there and not done in the privacy of my own shop to myself. So, uh, you know, am I going to lose sleep over it? No. Things happen. You make mistakes. You move on. So, um... Anyway, I'm going to show a couple of view appreciation gifts. And okay, so our first gift here is from James Green. And I'm assuming a lot of you guys know who James is. And if you don't, I suggest you go check out his channel. There's a link down below in the description. And I'll put one right around here in the video. Uh, excellent channel. A lot of gunsmithing, machining, welding. Um, a lot of looking at older tools. Uh, some of you that are on the... Uh, YouTube uh, machining forum uh, on on Facebook um, know him as uh, one of the uh, moderators there and a frequent contributor. Um, so he learned that I was getting married. Actually, next month getting married is the wedding, and he decided to send this along as a little gift. So on the machining side, we have two. Unused, very nice, 3 8 by inch and a half cut, um, four flute roughing end mills. Uh, these are Israeli made. Uh, Hanita is the brand. Very, very nice quality. Definitely be able to put those to use. And he also sent me, this is a Putnam uh, 11 64 uh, little end mill. You know, ones that you look at and you snap off. But let me tell you, if you got in, get in someplace tight, Something like this, invaluable. So we'll definitely be able to put this to use. And they make the smaller ones two-sided for a reason. Because he bound to snap one off. And of course, no package from James is complete without his channel swag. So we have his um, YouTube card there. And short series shenanigans is his channel's uh, long-running series. We also have... A nice sticker here, and I have um, I've got a, I have some other ones too. I have to put up. I just have to find a good place to display them. And once we do, we'll put them all up. I also have that sign from Keith Fenner, and also a nice notepad with his channel logo out. And you know how can go wrong with a notepad from the shop? Oh, but wait, there's more. This is the star of the box that he sent me, and. There it is. Um, and if I butcher this, I know somebody will correct me. Uh, Seren St. Vrain's Taos Lightning. Uh, it's a single barrel uh, whiskey. So this isn't blended. This is all bottled from a single, one single barrel. Actually, there was a seal on here that it was numbered with the date and the batch number. And this is made local to James and Adelaide, New Mexico is where it's made. Again, hoping I pronounced that right. And this is, uh, this is very good stuff, let me tell you. Um, I usually drink the go-to drink that everybody, ha every bar or place you go to is going to have is Jack Daniels is usually what I drink. Um, but I also drink uh, some, some select scotches like Laphroaig and things like that. And this is, this is very, very good. Um, nice smoky flavor to it. It's, it's very, it doesn't burn, um, it's just very good, and I've already had some, and um, I will definitely be having some later, and it's, it, so thank you, James, this is 
really good stuff. And I'll actually have to try to see if we can, I can get it locally out here. I might not be able to, but we'll give it a shot. But it's definitely, definitely delicious. So up next here is another um, box here, and this comes to me from uh, Rich Applebaum, who goes by Chipmaker1066 on YouTube, uh, link here and down in the um, description. And he has a, uh, a machine shop out in his barn, I believe, he's, I believe he's in New York, so he hasn't been, his barn is um, unheated. So he hasn't been posting a lot of videos for, for the uh, the winter, but he has a lot of smaller machines that you guys would be really interested in. Uh, he has a closing mill, he had an atlas, uh, one of those little atlas horizontal mills, um, a smaller lathe, a, a lot, a lot of cool stuff that a lot of basement shop guys will have the smaller equipment. Um, and it's re some really cool stuff to look at. Um, so check his channel out, and he sent me along some things that I thought I could use, and some things that um, didn't quite fit his machines. So first, which I which I found funny, is he saw the video of the uh, oiler on mine, and he had this little guy that he wanted to fit up to one of his machines, but, you know, found out it was kind of a pain in the neck with all the metering uh, devices in there. So it's a little uh, little pump boiler like mine. Now my plan with this, what I think I'm going to do with this, is I'm going to hook it up to the mill and I'm going to put the spindle oil in this. So then every time I can go there and just pump this and spindle oil goes right into the oilers. Um, I think I'm going to modify this for that use. So that's an awesome present there. We also have some setup blocks here. Um, John made them. John more than likely isn't with us anymore. And uh, these are, let's see what the size of these are. These are inch and a half by two and a half by one. And two of them, shop made, obviously. Can never have too many set of blocks. I don't have any, actually, so those will be the first ones. We got a little V-block here. Now there's no maker on this that I see. It's possible that it is shop made. A little bit of surface rust, nothing much, but definitely usable for what I do. A little um, brown and sharp one inch micrometer. Now, I, I have a, a, a brown and sharp one inch micrometer. Mine's a little bit different. Instead of having the ratchet thimble, uh, the one I have actually has the friction thimble. And personally, again, personal preference, I prefer the brown and sharp um, me, uh, measuring equipment. I prefer the brown and sharp micrometers, especially the one inch. Um, maybe not the larger sizes, but at least the one inch. I prefer the one inch micrometer over Starrett. And I also prefer um, the brown and sharp. Um, calipers over uh, over other brands, so it's very very nice. Um, still in still in pretty good shape, nice and shiny, nice and smooth. We also have a couple of larger end mills. Now he even said, and he's like, I know I know they aren't the best quality in the world, but you know for taking off that scale off of some nasty metal, good to use for that, so you're not beating the crap out of your good stuff. So definitely serviceable. The best one out of the bunch is probably um, probably these two here. Um, not too bad in the front. You can see they're non-center cutting. See that the flutes don't go to the center. But um, for those larger larger pieces where you have a big block and you need to face the side with it, definitely come in handy. We also have in here. This is an old uh, Brown and Shop uh, shell mill. And it's a left-hand shell mill, uh, inch and a half diameter. You can see it's very old just by the box, and it, but it's brand new. I mean, that's that's sharper than that'll, that'll slice you open without even thinking about it. Now, by left-hand, what they mean is just like a left-hand drill. You have to spin the mill backwards for it to cut. Okay, you can see how the flutes are. And this is a uh, if I can get it out of the package. This is brand new. 
obviously very old. It's a one inch, not one inch, I'm sorry, five eighths. Five eighths Cleveland twist drill. It does not want to come out of the package. Anyway, I don't want to take it out of there, but uh, it's a it's a long reach um, five eighths drill, and the flutes go up to about here. So you got that for cutting range, brand new in the package. So definitely, definitely some a bunch of stuff I can use. So. Uh, thank you, Rich, on this, and um, we'll definitely put these to use in some setups and uh, some drilling and some milling and oh, some oiling, too. All right, so let's hop over to the mill, and we'll show you how to adjust the gibs and adjust the backlash. All right, so gib adjustment is all relative to you and what you're feeling with the mill. All right, um, if you which is weird if if you look up any kind of instructions on on how to do it from the actual even even up to the newer hot hinge manuals it says basically do it by feel tighten the gib until you feel resistance on your hand wheel from moving whatever uh, movable axis back and forth that the gibs attached to um, and it's basically the same same idea as you do it on a lathe you tighten up the gib until you feel uh, a little bit of resistance and what that resistance is is the actual gib being pressed into the inside of this dovetail gibs are there to um, be able to adjust for wear wear in the in the in whatever uh, movable axis um, they're attached to now unlike say the salt bend lathe and some other lathes and smaller equipment where they have a straight gib which is just a piece of metal that sits up against the dovetail with four or five or however many screws down the row of it and you tighten each one individually uh, on this as in larger pieces of equipment it's a tapered gib so the one, one of them is right behind your felt wiper in the front right here you see this screw this screw engages a tapered gib so let me pull it out okay you see that the gib there is tapered. We're thinner at this side than we are at this side. And it slides in even with the dovetail. So the further it goes in, it acts like a wedge. And the more it engages this side of the dovetail and the other side of the saddle here. Now, if you look at the bottom of the saddle, if you watch some of my other videos of me putting this together, this side of the bottom of the saddle has a matching opposite um, taper of this. So basically what happens is as you tighten this that acts like a wedge and puts more material, more pressure on this dovetail in this dovetail and would allow you to take up for any sort of slop in this whole sliding axis. So give me a second and let me get this screw in place. Okay, our gib is even with the front here. Make sure that the table lock is off and whatever access you're doing. Tighten it down. Move your hand wheel back and forth. And you'll get to a point. Now I'm in the middle of the travel of this, of this saddle. This is where most of the wear is going to be. So you can't, which you, which you, what I did is you get it nice and tight and snug and feeling like you want it to feel in the middle and then run your whole travel of whatever axis you're doing. If you feel it binding on the ends, then you have to loosen up the gib. So, right there I can feel the screw getting tight and I can feel it dragging. Alright, now I'm on the outskirts of that travel. I just felt it get a little looser. Tighten it up. All right, that's too tight. Go one turn. All right, that's it there. Now I'm gonna wheel this all the way in as far as it can go. All right, I feel it getting really tight right there. So I'm gonna back this off just a hair. All right, that's that's pretty good. Maybe just a little bit more. All right, that's definitely better. 
All right, and we just went a little looser right there. And we feel good all the way out. Just a little bit tighter right there. That's where the most wear is. Now, if you're cutting and you're getting some funktastic finish finishes, you can try adjusting these gibbs. Again, it's more of a feel thing. You'll have to feel it uh, when you do it. The funny thing is, and I'll put a link of, of the video down below, is um, Keith Rucker did a video of doing this on his uh, Wells Index machine. And they actually have a numerical value of what the Gibbs should be tight, tightened to. Um, they had you place an indicator around certain, certain spots on the mill, like on uh, measure the outside of the ways and pull on it, and you'll get X amount of deflection, and you would adjust your Gibbs to that deflection was off. I'm, you could probably do the same thing with this, but every, um, every manual uh, on these mills just points to doing it by feel, and again, you're going to have to kind of do it by feel because your extremes of your travel closer out here and further into it's the column are going to be less worn than in the middle. Um, so this is a happy medium and if I have an issue with the uh, finish issue or anything like that I can certainly go back and readjust them. The biggest thing is you just don't want them too tight. If you run them really really tight you'll just, you're just promoting more wear than anything else. So um, now I'm going to go handheld here to show you where the other ones are. So there's one here for the saddle. There's one right here, and that's for the table. And there's one under that, um, that way wiper, and that one's for the knee. Okay, so now we're going to go into uh, the backlash of the screws here. Okay, so what is backlash? Well, backlash is basically slop in the screw or slop in the feed nut. Um, backlash is measured by, it's, it's what the hand wheels will turn before they actually start the, the nuts engage and start to move the table. So I pretty much back the, the, um, the adjustment screw off to give you a ton of backlash. So if I set this to zero here, right? All right, so that's zero. And I can turn this hand wheel a full... Now it's actually easier to read it this way. I can turn this hand wheel a full, say, 45 thousandths before I feel that the hand wheel get resistance on it and start to move the table. So that's backlashing the screw. Now why is that important? Well, on a lathe it isn't that bad because your backlash is linear. On a mill like this, it's a lot more important because you have two hand wheels on both sides and you're going to be going back and forth. So you're going to be feeding across the part in this direction and then coming back this way. Okay, so say you wanted a slot that was a hundred thousands. Right? So you would start here, start at zero, you would go a hundred thousands, right? Now you want to reverse back towards me, okay? A hundred thousands. Well, there's a problem. You can't just go right back because now I'm already at um, 60 thousands. So I already moved this hand wheel. 40 thousandths, but my table hasn't moved. So if I go back to my zero, I only traveled 40 thousandths back in this direction. I didn't travel back the whole 100 thousandths. To go the whole 100 thousandths, I would have to add 40 more to that to equal out that full slop. So slop in a mill like this is more of a hassle than anything else. Um, you can eliminate this issue if you have a DRO but not everybody has a DRO. Ideally what you want is about five thousandths worth of backlash worth of slop in the handles in in the X and Y axis. 
So what they do, now this is what's inside that little knuckle in the center of the mill. This is your feed nut, okay? So this is what the actual y-axis and x-axis screw go into. So y-axis is in this, this direction, the screw's in the, this direction like this, and the x-axis one is like this on a little bit lower underneath it. Now if you look at this nut, it's split. And let me grab a ruler here. And you can see it's split about three quarters of the way through. And the reason why it's split is so it, you can adjust the backlash. Now there is a large screw, and I'll show it down below, that engages right into this slot. Okay? Well, you can see where it is in relation to the slot, it's right at the top. Okay, so you put the ruler in here. You can see in relation to the slot where the screw is. When we tighten down this screw, okay, when we tighten this down, this little piece that's still connected acts as a flexor. This gap closes. What that does is basically make the nuts, instead of being nice and straight in line, they bend out like this, which lets the threads in here actually physically bind on the, on the screw and engage more of the Acme thread. That's what lessens your backlash. Now, what you can do on bridge ports, newer mills uh, have a better design of their feed nuts, whereas these two pieces, instead of being kept together with a flexure, like this, are physically and 100% split in half, okay? And you can do that. What you do is take a bandsaw, split your nuts right in half, okay? Face both sides. When you put them into the little knuckle piece in there, you put one in first, and you can see here's an oil hole, that's what that hole is. You put one in first, and you can put in a nice felt space uh, spacer in there, and then put your second one in. When you, put, when you feed your screw in there, there's a key that holds you straight, obviously, or holds those from rotating. When you put your screw in there, you'll feel it go into this, and then you'll probably feel it bind and hit as it tries to go into the next set of threads, because the threads aren't quite lined up. So then you just pull your screw out, in turn, and then you'll finally feel it engage that second, second set. Now you have a wider gap in here for these two nuts to physically move in and out of each other. That will allow you to uh, get a lot more life out of these nuts. You would basically have to wear out almost all the threads on this to, um, to end up with having to replace the nuts because you have way more of an adjustment and as you adjust it, what it's doing is it's smushing more of this, um, of this nut material, more of the threads of this nut into the threads of the screw. So you have a lot more adjustment. Now I didn't, I didn't do that. Um, Cause first I didn't want to break anything and I figured it would be easier. I wanted to see exactly how much wear and everything this mill had on it. And I, I, I thought it was just more than a hassle. But if you guys out there that have one of these mills that can't get the adjustment that you want out of it, okay, you can't, cause these will only flex a certain amount. If any of you guys can't get the backlash out or to a point where you can that you consider acceptable try splitting out your nuts I know it sounds painful but um, split the nuts and then adjust them and I bet you you'll find it much much better so now the easier um, nut to adjust is on the table because you can get to it underneath now I'm gonna lower you and I'm gonna show you where it is okay so now you're looking at the underside of the left side of the table there and you see a big flathead screw and a little flathead screw. So that big flathead screw is your adjustment screw. The tighter you make that, the, the um, more that nut is going to flex and engage on that Acme screw. And then that other smaller flathead screw below that, that is your uh, lockdown screw. So once you get that to the tightness that you want, 
just tighten that smaller screw and you can lock it down. So now I'm going to set the table directly in the middle of its travel, alright, and I'm going to bring you up above so you can see the dial, and I'm going to tighten that screw, I'm going to test the backlash and see what we can get it at. Okay, so we have right now about 45 thousandths worth of backlash in that screw, okay? So I'm going to take a long screwdriver, we're going to go right into that screw, and we're going to give her, say, a quarter of a turn. All right, just by doing that quarter of a turn, my backlash has been reduced to twelve. Okay, I'm gonna see if we can get that down any further. I'm looking for somewhere around five. That's seven there. That's seven thousandths work worth of backlash directly in the middle. So what I'm gonna do right now. I can use the power feed to do this too. All I did is traverse it out to its farthest reaches. All right, this is where the screw is the least worn. Let me get you a better view here. So out here, out at the further furthest reaches. Actually, I want to go somewhere around there. Now this is where the screw is is not worn at all, and our backlash is about two and a half, three. So seven in the middle, two and a half, three on the end. I'm gonna leave it at that. I got a DRO, so um, you know it's not a killer for me, but you can see how much we took that backlash out. Okay, so uh, x-axis is relatively easy. Why is a pain in the ass? Um, because the the nut, the feed nut is so far in there that you have, and you have these guards here, you have no way to get at it. The only way to get at it is to remove the actual feed screw. So, um, basically, you have to guess and keep rechecking. So I had 10 thousandths worth of uh, backlash on this to begin with. That was my initial adjustment. So you got to take the screw all the way out. All the way out. And then you look down here, and I'll get you a shot of it, and you'll see the um, the feed nut and the adjustment screws. Okay, so there's the front of the mill. You look all the way down there, and there is the um, feed nut and the adjustment screws. So basically, you have to just tighten it, give it a tighten, tighten the set screw, uh, screw everything in, rinse, repeat, and uh, you know do it until you're satisfied. That's what makes this uh, kind of a pain in the butt, but... Okay, we made an adjustment there.
put in at least two screws and see what we did to make a difference. So right there I got seven. I have seven thousands. Um, in the middle, let me see what I got at the end. So it's starting to get tight at the end there. At the end I got uh, I got four there. And I can actually still go a little further. My uh, my vice is hitting the column. So we're actually gonna leave it at that. And uh, that's how you adjust it. So, hope you guys enjoyed this video. And uh, we'll see you on the next one where we're going to go through the head and uh, take care of all the good stuff in there.